Good evening, everyone. Welcome to CIE SF Technical Seminar. Um, it's our pleasure to um, provide a technical seminar on satellite uh, internet with our distinguished speaker today, William Kao, Dr. William Kao. Uh, I am Yan Shu. I am one of the staff members of CIE SF. I will uh, begin by introducing um, the Chinese Institute of Engineers, San Francisco Bay Area chapter to all of you. I do see some familiar names in the participant list. Welcome back and uh, also welcome new friends. Before that, I would like to show our media channels, including our official website, cie-sf.org. And uh, we have uh, a weekly newsletter. We have a Facebook uh, webpage. Also, um, we're on LinkedIn, WeChat, YouTube, and the LINE chat group. Hi, many of you are familiar with the Chinese Institute of Engineers. Um, the organization uh, has uh, quite a long history in the United States. Um, the first um, CIE was established in Cornell University back in 1917. Two of the very famous only fathers are Zhang Tianyu and Lin Hongxun. They're the, um, one of the first uh, foreign students uh, study abroad from China. And uh, um, CIE has celebrated its 100th anniversary in Bay Area in 2017. And uh, in this year, 2022, we're celebrating 105th anniversary. Um, our Bay Area chapter was established in 1979. Um, the purpose and object of our chapter is that we are a nonprofit organization serving engineers and students in San Francisco Bay Area engineering community. And we're extending to the broader STEM community as well. The missions of our chapter include promoting technological advancement, promoting networking and communication among engineers and scientists, and to promote the well being of the whole engineering community. Um, in the past years, we have hosted many um, activities in the Bay Area. Um, these are the offline in-person activities that we held pre-pandemic time. Um, since pandemic, we moved all our activities to online. Uh, I have a following slide on that. So we've held many um, events technical seminars, networking opportunities, and uh, job hunting uh, opportunities and seminars uh, and guest speakers um, in various um, occasions. Okay, oh, under our Bay Area chapter, we have five technical groups. Um, today, uh, it is Emerging Technology Group, and electronic design technology group that are co-hosting this seminar today. We also have electrical engineering and computer science. We also have biomedical engineering group and the young CIE group. So if you are interested to know more about um, each group, please check our website and uh, follow one of the media channels. We really value the power of networking. We know that um, 
we know that we ha have hosted uh, uh, many networking events, including um, meals, lunches, and uh, also uh, networking events. And uh, we are trying to bring back on offline in-person activities as soon as possible. Um, so during the pandemic year in 2020 into 2021, and also this year, um, it has been all virtual for us, um, but we made our uh, best efforts to continue to provide technology uh, knowledge sharing and also uh, get together events. Um, we have hosted events on Zoom and also um, um, uh, together Tom, and uh, we have uploaded uh, nearly all our video recordings to our YouTube channel, including today's seminar. So here uh, is a list of all the seminars that we hosted recently. Um, if you are interested to watch, um, please feel free. We uh, keep a record of our events on Eventbrite and also on our YouTube channel and also our e-newsletter. So in case uh, you're interested to check out our YouTube channel, it is here. You can search CIE space SF and uh, you will see our channel. And uh, all our uh, webinars have been uploaded to this channel. Uh, allow me to take uh, one moment to introduce um, a very important upcoming event. Uh, we are hosting the 43rd annual conference in Bay Area. Um, it is an in-person event and uh, um, the event will be on May the 14th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. I have a um, tentative schedule here. Uh, we start at 12 p.m. and uh, we end at uh, around 9.30. And in, in the afternoon, we do have uh, four speaker sessions, um, different technology topics. And uh, I believe the next slide. Um, here we have some of the um, key speakers for this annual conference on May the 14th. You can find more details um, on our website. So um, you can also take a screenshot now. And I will introduce our uh, speaker today, um, Dr. William Kao. Uh, Dr. William Kao has given many, many um, talks and seminars at CIE SF, so I believe many of you are familiar. Um, he received uh, um, BSEE and MSE and a PhD from the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. He worked in the semiconductor and electronic design automation industries for more than 30 years. He's holding several senior and ex executive engineering management positions at Texas Instruments, Xerox Corporation, and Cadence Design Systems. He has authored more than 40 technical papers on ICCAD at IEEE journals and conferences, and holds eight software and IC design patents. He was an adjunct professor at uh, UCLA Electrical Engineering Department, where he taught courses in computer aid IC design. Um, he is also a senior member of IEEE and one of the founding members of IEEE Circuits and Systems um, in Silicon Valley chapter. He currently teaches clean technology and emerging technology courses at the University of California, Santa Cruz, Silicon Valley Extension. He has given more than 90 seminars in the past 10 years on um, various emerging technologies, including clean technology, renewable energy, big data and the data analytics, IoT, uh, smart cities, sensor networks, innovation, augmented and virtual reality, 
robotics, AI, machine learning, 5G, 3D printing, and satellite communications. Wow, that's a long list. <laughs> Um, uh, most importantly, uh, Dr. Kao is a technology watcher, learner, and a teacher. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to the speaker, Dr. William Kao. Uh, thank you, Yansu. Allow me a few minutes to set up my uh, Zoom screen so that All right, so uh, hopefully everyone can see the screen. Can you hear me all okay? Yes, it's okay. fine. All right, so... Um, let me see. Welcome uh, to uh, this evening's presentation on the satellite communications. Uh, this slide shows the agenda for this evening's talk. Um, uh, basically, I'll start with a introduction of the subject matter, uh, what is satellite communications and uh, why is it needed? Uh, the next thing I'll go over is some of the uh, satellite technology, talk about uh, low earth orbit, medium Earth orbit and geosynchronous Earth orbit, um, which uh, distinguishes depending on the altitude that satellites are located with respect to Earth. Uh, recently, the most well-known uh, LEO, uh, which is a low Earth orbit um, internet satellite communication is from SpaceX. So I'll spend uh, a lot of times talking about the specifics about the Starlink system. Uh, after that, I also mentioned a few of the competitors uh, from Amazon uh, and some of the even, even abroad from China, the Hongyan system. We'll talk also about some issues that exist in, the, in outer space, uh, like uh, debris and uh, uh, light pollution and the impact on astronomy, uh, astronomers. And uh, the last subject I'll, I'll cover is the integration of uh, terrestrial and satellite integration. Uh, in the past, I've also talked about 5G, which is really land-based uh, communications, internet communications. And uh, it's very important to integrate the, the space-based communications with the land-based communication. So I'll talk a little bit briefly about that matter and then conclude by giving a summary and conclusion. So uh, let me start by introducing the subject matter and uh, talking about some of the current events. I'm pretty sure that in the past five weeks or so, everybody is, uh, is uh, tracking and monitoring what's happening in the Ukraine Soviet Union uh, war um, in, the, in, in Europe. And uh, at the beginning of the war, uh, Russia, of course, the first thing they try to do is to block some of the internet uh, connections in Ukraine. And they dismantle a lot of the uh, communications. So at that time, the, the vice prime minister from Ukraine, who is also the minister in charge of digital transformation, he actually uh, sent a request to Elon Musk to ask him to uh, install and activate the Starlink uh, satellite communications capability for Ukraine. And uh, everybody, Elon Musk is a very proactive person. Within 48 hours, actually the Starlink uh, 
connectivity was established. Um, so originally, uh, the Starlink uh, internet service was supposed to start in the North America, you know, basically US, Canada, and uh, Western Europe. And uh, so, but now because of the war, actually Ukraine was one of the earliest uh, beneficiaries of the Starlink internet system. So this was about five weeks ago, okay, at the beginning of the war. And just in the last couple of days, uh, the latest news was that everybody, if is uh, are, are tracking the developments of the, the war, is that uh, the flagship from the um, Soviet uh, death, uh, the, the, the Black Sea uh, fleet was actually sunk just in the last couple of days. Everybody probably have also heard about that news. And uh, there was a uh, uh, communications from Russia that uh, they actually were planning to try to destroy the Starlink satellite constellation because they claim that it was because of the, of the connectivity and the information provided by the Starlink satellite system that enable the, the missile system to uh, destroy and sink the, the, the cruiser ship. So, uh, so basically, I guess this is actually in the news as we speak. So this is a very current and hot topic right now. So um, this is a picture that says uh, battle of the billionaires. Everybody knows that uh, Putin is also one of the world's richest person. And uh, right now, Elon Musk is also probably the probably right number one currently, uh, slightly ahead of Jeff Bezos. So uh, it's the battle of the billionaires. And this slide is actually followed with the next slide, which is even within the US, uh, talking about the, the subject for this evening is that in the space internet zone, uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are actually competing for, you know, uh, who actually will win the space internet war. Uh, of course, our, everybody knows that Amazon is very interested to provide internet service across the whole globe, not only where there are internet connections, but remote areas, as well as in the air. Like for instance, whenever you're boarding a plane, very often there's no not internet on the planes. So, all of that will be enabled by a space internet uh, connectivity. So this is what we call battle of the billionaires. And actually even uh, later on, you'll see a slide that there's a third billionaire, uh, Richard Bronson from the UK, who is also getting into the space internet business. Okay, so let me, let me uh, introduce use the subject matter by talking a little bit uh, uh, about all the what, why, and who and where about uh, space internet. Why we need it, what is it, and so on. So everybody is aware that uh, uh, on land, there's, also, it's, there's always uh, uh, cell towers and uh, internet providers on land. However, when you go to slightly remote areas or uh, less populated areas, that service is not that good because uh, of course there's no uh, uh, cell tower connectivities in remote areas. So that is a problem. Also like for instance, if you are in the, in the middle of the desert or you are in the high seas, also there's no very, no or little, very little communication. So everything is reliant on uh, space and satellite technology, including uh, navigation. That's another use of the satellite like GPS. Everybody's aware of GPS. That's also satellite based. So the need is that if you want to cover the whole earth with internet service, you need to supply this service where today right now is still not um, very efficient, okay? So uh, just a short slide on the internet, 
everybody is aware that there are three, three uh, kinds of internet. One is the landline internet, where uh, it basically relies on uh, optical fibers uh, to supply uh, uh, optical fibers as well as copper uh, cables, right? The next one is the via the, the mobile technology, you know, cell phones and cell towers. So that's uh, based on the, the mobile technology. And the one that we're talking this, this evening will be based on space and will be based on relying on satellite technology. So for uh, satellite uh, internet, basically we, rely, we need to have three dishes. One is the one that actually sends the, the provider sends the signal to space, uh, which is really captured and then resend it back by the satellite that is uh, circling, circling Earth. And then finally, our, our own uh, dish at home or at the office then captures the signal. So there are basically three components uh, or dishes. So if you compare uh, space satellite versus the current land-based or mobile technologies, there are some pros and cons of the satellite internet. Uh, currently, there's actually already existent uh, satellite uh, internet, but this is provided by a couple of firms that rely on geosynchronous orbit, which is much further away from the planet. And therefore the speed that the, the response speed is much slower. So um, this evening we'll be talking about mainly about LEO. LEO is a low earth orbit, which is much closer to planet the planet. And therefore the response time is much faster. Okay. Now, uh, if, this, if the signal relies on satellite, of course there are some uh, disadvantages like for instance, if there's really a big storm, uh, also the, the time that it takes the, for the signal to travel to the space and then back. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it is actually expensive. So those are some of the pros and cons of satellite internet compared to the other uh, internet technologies. So the way that the broadband satellite uh, works is actually pretty simple. Uh, you have uh, first the Earth station. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can see the pointer here. The Earth station, the Earth station or the internet service provider sends the signals to, to outer space. And there's a lot of satellites in the LEO because of the proximity of Earth, it requires a lot of uh, satellites. I'll cover that a little bit later on in terms of the number of satellites that is required for low Earth or orbit. And then uh, the signals uh, get uh, transmitted back to Earth and then uh, our, our home dishes or our, our, our business um, dishes that are installed on, on either our home or our office captures the signal, okay? Now, this is uh, uh, another uh, picture that conveys the same thing. If we start from the, from the ground level, so hopefully you see my pointer moving. Uh, down down on, the, on Earth, you have a lot of uh, technology that is land-based and mobile uh, cell tower based, uh, like 5G and things like that. Uh, and then you have in the middle, you have uh, uh, drones and you have helicopters. And then you have uh, the first outer layer is called the LEO, low Earth, low Earth orbit. And further away, there's the GEO, geosynchronous. That's further away. In the middle, there's also the MEO, medium Earth orbit, which uh, most of the GPS, global positioning systems, are based on medium Earth orbit. I'll talk a little bit more specifics later on in the, in the later slides. So currently there are five uh, active uh, satellite providers, satellite service, internet service providers, not five, actually right now there's less than that. Right now the two that are currently available are HughesNet and Viasat. 
As a matter of fact, you probably have seen some of the advertisements on your TV, okay, about the uh, satellite uh, internet. Now, the ones that we're talking about tonight are mostly the new ones, the ones that will be provided by SpaceX, and that's the Starlink system. Also, Amazon also plans to put into orbit. Uh, there's a, a project called Project Kuiper that uh, also will, will send thousands of satellites into space and provide uh, internet connectivity. Okay, and then in the UK, uh, there's a, a company called OneWeb. Okay. Now, uh, low low Earth orbit satellites because they are much closer to Earth. Therefore, it requires a much larger number of satellites. I'll show that in a picture later on. Uh, and everybody, so it's sort of intuitive because the higher or the further away you are on, from planet Earth, the, the satellite can cover a much wider area, okay? Uh, but if you're closer to, to Earth, then the area that you cover is much less, so it requires a much larger number of satellites. So for a low Earth orbit, it requires a constellation. That means that there's a lot of satellites, okay? Uh, just like people talk about star constellation, okay? For satellites, it's the same. It requires a high number of satellites, okay? So, the numbers that we're talking about, for instance, Starlink's plan is that it proposes to have more than 10,000 satellites. Now, this is in the, in the long run. This is like several years away. For the minimum number of satellites, we'll talk about probably in the few hundreds are the minimum that is required to cover the whole planet. But in the long run, because the some of these satellites also are short-lived, they, they last about seven years. So uh, backup satellites and so on are required, okay? So some of will, the uh, or, uh, satellites will be sent to the space. Some of them will actually malfunction or run out of life, okay? So that's, uh, we'll cover also all these subjects later in the later slides. So just to compare, you know, way back when the Soviet Union first launched the first satellite, uh, right now there's only been only about a uh, few thousand satellites that altogether in the history of mankind that has been sent to outer space. And right now today, there's about 3000 working satellites. Like for instance, for example, GPS, navigational satellites, weather satellites, uh, scientific satellites and so on. And when we talk about the constellation, that's the number is going to be really, you know, multiplied by five to 10 or 20 fold. Okay, so this is a significant development in terms of uh, space uh, technology. Okay, so a little bit about uh, orbits, just to give you some idea about how satellites uh, work and the circle or navigate around Earth. So I mentioned that there are three kinds. LEO, which is the closer to the planet, is a low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and geosynchronous Earth orbit. Um, some of the existent uh, satellite internets are geo. That means that the, the, their satellites are fewer in number and they're further away from the planet. So they're about 22,000 miles above the planet Earth. The MEO, mostly they're, they're right now, the, the, the ones, the satellites that are in the medium Earth orbit are like GPS satellites. Like for instance, uh, uh, GPS is the US base and then you have uh, European and Soviet Union. And, and actually the Beidou system from China is the, is the most recent one that just was uh, completed last year. And tonight our focus will be mostly on the LEO orbit, which will be much closer. We're talking about only a few hundred miles above planet Earth. Okay. So this picture, I think will explain very quickly the difference between the three 
the, if you look at the inner orbit, the one that closest to the planet, that's the Leo. We're talking about, uh, I'm going to be using interchangeable between kilometers and miles. So if you want to do the conversion, here's the conversion between a mile and a kilometer. Um, so the Leo is the one closest to the planet. It goes from 320 to uh, about 1,000 kilometers above the planet. The Mio, medium Earth, uh, it goes about 8,000 to 12,000 kilometers above the planet. And then the geo, geosynchronous, is more than 30,000 kilometers away from the planet. So uh, tonight we'll be talking about mainly about the, these two, the geo and the leo, which is about re related to the uh, satellite communication. We're not going, going to be focusing tonight on GPS. Uh, so Leo, low Earth orbit, 400 to 1600 miles above Earth. So as you get closer to the planet, the, the, the range or the, the area that is covered by each satellite, will, because it's the proximity to Earth, will be much smaller than if you are high above the planet. Because if you're high above the planet, you require only about three or four satellites and you can cover the entire planet because you're further away, okay? Uh, the other difference is that the speed that the satellites travel, the LEO satellites travel much faster. They circle uh, the planet in, in maybe less than two hours, while the GEO, it, it moves about the, the speed of the, the planet moves, okay? So it takes about 24 hours. So this is the comparison chart uh, between, between the Leo, Mio, and Geo. So first of all, proximity to Earth. Okay, here is measuring kilometers. The Leo is much closer to the planet. It's about 200 to 3,000 kilometers, while the Geo is the furthest away, it's about 36,000 kilometers away. The time, as I said, the, the speed that the satellites travel it takes about less than two hours to, to circulate or circle around the Earth for the LEO satellites. Well, it takes about 24 hours to complete a, a orbit uh, for GEO, okay? So the, this is the, the speed. So speed of the low Earth LEO satellites is much faster. Uh, also the, the time, that, or the response time that it takes for the signal to go up and down uh, you know, what you call it latency or delay, uh, because uh, they are closer to the planet, Leo's satellites are respond much, much faster. Okay. This is measured in terms of milliseconds. And then the number of satellites, as I mentioned, as you get further away from the planet, it requires less number of satellites for geo. Okay. So you need only one, uh, Cover, covers almost the whole Earth and then one in the back and, and so on, right? So there's only about two or three satellites for geosynchronous orbit. While for low Earth orbit, it requires at least 50 to 70. So um, the Starlink and uh, Project Kuiper will take actually hundreds of satellites uh, navigating around the planet. Okay. So that's uh, in general, a little bit more, some general idea about uh, satellite uh, orbits and so on. So now I'm going to dive into the Starlink uh, satellite system, uh, communication system. So uh, they say, well, is Starlink the Earth uh, internet service provider? Okay, so that's mainly the, the topic for, the main topic for tonight. So just to talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between SpaceX and Starlink. SpaceX is the name of the company that uh, Elon Musk founded uh, way back in 2002. And the, the main task or the main goal or charter for SpaceX was actually colonization of Mars. And uh, before uh, embarking into Starlink, uh, SpaceX was mainly known because of the reusable rockets. So 
they, they, they pioneer in a technology in order to cut down the space uh, uh, cost is that if you can reuse the rockets that you use to launch your, your uh, satellites or, or whatever you want to send into space, if the rockets, it's not like just basically you, you use it and you throw it away, you, you can cut down the cost by making it reusable. So uh, SpaceX has a technology where you, you fire the, the rockets and then at least portion of the rockets can come back and re-land uh, on a platform on, on, the, on the sea and then re you can reuse it for your next shot. So uh, now the latest venture that they got, the SpaceX got into what's called the Starlink project, which is the, the subject for tonight's presentation. Okay, so it's a constellation of satellites and uh, as of uh, beginning of this year, uh, uh, SpaceX has already sent out about 1,600 satellites in orbit, okay. Uh, most of the, these ones, they have been using the Falcon X rocket, reusable rocket, and they also have a next generation uh, rocket called Starship that I'll cover a little bit later on. So um, <clears throat> the goal of Starlink is to provide high speed and low latency. That means a very uh, short response time for the signal to travel to space and back. And the target uh, customers are people living in rural uh, or semi-rural areas. And uh, they use basically uh, three frequency bands, the K, Q, and the V, uh, I'll talk about what, what are the frequency ranges for these three bands, okay? Now the satellites, they were mostly at an altitude of 550 kilometers or about 350 miles uh, above earth. And uh, the long range plan or the complete plan is to send up altogether close to 12,000 satellites, okay? This is over a period of many years. So initially, if you have, as I mentioned in the first few, in the previous slides, is that if you have a, a, a hundred or so satellites, you can already establish global service, okay? So again, this is similar to the previous slide for the way the Starlink uh, works is that you have a ground station and you beam the signal. This is called the, the, the uplink where you, you, you load the signal, transmit the signal to the satellite, and then there's a downlink, which is the time that it takes for the signal to travel from the satellite to the home dish or business uh, dish. So there's the ground station, uh, the satellite itself, and the user terminal, okay? Now I mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, Starlink currently uses three bands or, or are using three bands. Uh, the reason why I say already using is because they actually it's already past beta. Okay, so cool, it goes from 12 to 18 gigahertz. The K band goes from 27 to 40 gigahertz and the V band goes from 40 to 75 gigahertz. So this is the, the picture in terms of uh, uh, light spectrum or the or the the broadband spectrum, uh, the Q is between 12 18, the K goes from 27 to 40, and the V from 40 to 75. Okay, so uh, a little bit more about the satellites. You know, so they, they look a little bit like a table. Uh, so this is a, the looks that are a little bit different than, than some of the past satellites. So each satellite weighs about 500 pounds and it's about the size of a table, okay? Now, uh, in between the satellites, so this is the constellation. There's, they actually, the satellites travel in orbits, okay? So each satellite communicates with five other satellites, okay? So uh, there are altogether five links, two to, satellites are in the same orbit. So let's say that this is one of the orbits, okay? So uh, this one 
it communicates with this one and that one. So that's in the same orbit. And then it also talks to one satellite in adjacent orbits. So it talks to this one and this one. That these are two adjacent orbits uh, with respect to this one. And then the last one, it talks to one that is uh, perpendicular, okay, uh, to the orbit, okay. So altogether, each satellite communicates with five other satellites in the constellation. Okay, so I mentioned a little bit just to show you some pictures about how this is done. So right now, Starlink basically uses the Falcon. Uh, this is uh, actually the Falcon rocket. And uh, number one, the, the main characteristic is that when the satellite is being sent to space or the, the rocket is being sent to space, actually some of the rocket, big portion of the rocket comes back to earth and it's reusable. Also within each launch, here's the inside of the cone. It shows that there are 60 of these satellites. So in one shot, there are 60 satellites that are being sent uh, per, per launch, okay? And not only that, but the rocket can be reused. So that's the way to cut down the cost, okay? So larger number of satellites per shot and reusable rockets. Now, uh, SpaceX is already uh, has a next generation rocket is the Starship. So if you compare the Starship here on the right side, you will have much higher payload. You will be able to carry 400 satellites per shot, okay? So again, the more satellites per shot, you cut down on the cost, right? You minimize the cost. Okay. I think this slide is pretty, pretty much I've covering some other slide. Uh, Leo, he uses Leo orbit. He has about, he's about 300 miles above the planet. Uh, it will talk to five other satellites. Um, and uh, it requires a large number of satellites, okay? So initially the service area covered by Starlink are mostly in the North America, US, Canada, and then uh, Europe. Okay, and of course you can add right now Ukraine to that list. In terms of the cost, so the, right now uh, the SpaceX Starlink program, it has two, two services, the, the regular and the premium, okay? So the regular is about initial cost is about $500 and the monthly uh, service cost is $99. And here we we'll talk about a little bit later about the performance, the speed to upload and download uh, signals or, or material, and also the time that it takes to respond. The, the premium is a little bit more expensive. Premium is mainly used for businesses. The regular is mostly for individual households. Uh, as I mentioned before, Starlink is already in beta. Uh, it already has been tried by, by over 10,000 customers, okay? And they expect that, so this is actually going to be a very lucrative business for SpaceX. They'll be able to collect $30 billion a year. So actually right now they realize that they will be leveraging uh, Starlink to, to fund the SpaceX uh, Mars program, okay? So eventually they want to reach Mars. Uh, but they're, they are, the way that they're doing is that they're financing it through the Starlink, okay? Just like many startups in the Bay Area, usually if you provide some service, you can get some income and then they can, they can be used to develop your final product. Okay, the kit, this is the, the, the way that the kit, if you uh, order a, a Starlink system, this is what comes to your house. Uh, that's the, the, the pizza, you know, the, the dish itself, uh, and then the tripod. Uh, it has also a router and the mounting kit, okay? So this is the first uh, uh, system that was uh, uh, marketed by uh, the Starlink system. 
After that, there was a second version, which is smaller and is actually rectangular. So this one is not a circular pizza. It's actually a, uh, a rectangular uh, dish. And it's much smaller than the circular one. Yeah, it's, um, so it's only 12 by 19 inches. And uh, it, weighs, it weighs less and it's smaller. So it weighs only 9.2 pounds. Okay. Also, uh, you can mount it not only on the top of the roof, but you can also stick it onto a pole and put it on your backyard. Okay. So that's the, those are the two uh, uh, home, home or business dishes that you see from the user, user terminal side. So in terms of the performance or the speed compared to some land-based internet and so on is that the the goal is that you eventually you reach one gigabit per second, okay? And so that's gonna be very competitive even with the land base, you know, we are, right now we all use uh, Xfinity or AT&T, right? For our internet service. So uh, latency speed right now is about in the 30 to 40 milliseconds. The final end goal is to be able to reach about 20 milliseconds speed, okay? so. Uh, as every product, it will keep improving. The performance will be becoming faster. The equipment will becoming smaller and lighter and so on, just like anything in, in electronics, right? Okay, so uh, this is not only, uh, uh, it's not only uh, SpaceX and Starlink that have thought about this system. Actually, there are a lot of other uh, companies who have the same idea. Everybody's competing because right now, for instance, companies like Amazon who are into the internet business, they're trying to sell uh, items on the internet. So they want to reach beyond the current customer base. They want to reach every customer on planet earth, right? So uh, I'll mention a little bit about currently the two that are already available and working today are HughesNet and Viasat. They rely on more on geo uh, orbit. So their response time is not going to be as, as uh, high performance as the LEO based systems, okay? Uh, so LEO based is going to be Starlink, uh, Amazon in, in a couple of years will also have a, a system called Kuiper and the UK also has a system under development or right now actually is also under beta called OneWeb. Uh, this is the Richard Branson uh, baby. And China is also, you know, very aggressive in terms of uh, space and satellite technology. So they also have a program called Hongyan uh, that is their development. And they are trying to do um, internet as well as 5G at the same uh, service at the same time using satellites. So if you compare the Starlink versus the current existing uh, vendors, HughesNet and Viasat, you can see that the speed is considerably better than, uh, than the HughesNet and Viasat. So Starlink is going to be reaching one gigabit per second while the other ones are also still in the megabits per second range. Also response time, you can see the big difference is about almost 50, well, 40 to 50 X faster. The latency for Starlink will be about 25 milliseconds compared to 700 milliseconds for HughesNet and VSI, just because the distance that the, the geo uh, orbits are much further away from earth. Okay, so this is the sort of like a graph form. If you compare Viasat, HughesNet, and Starlink, you can see, so we distinguish between upload and download. We mentioned about the signal traveling from the uh, provider down to the, up to the satellite and download is from the satellite back to earth. So there are two different speeds and you can see the difference between the Starlink system versus the current ones is much more, several times faster 
than the existing uh, systems. So this is uh, the comparison written down uh, in terms of um, download. Okay, uh, Starlink is about 80 megabits per second compared to 20 to 20 some uh, megabits per second for HughesNet and VSAT. And uh, upload Starlink is about 13.8 compared to HughesNet and Viasat 2.6 and 3.25. Uh, latency time, you can see there's considerable difference between the 42 meg milliseconds uh, for today's uh, systems. Uh, they want to even have that, uh, cut it down by half by, by later this year, compared to 700 milliseconds for the other ones. Okay, so uh, let's uh, just, just say a few words about the Amazon project called Project Kuiper. So Project Kuiper is also going to be Leo, Leo orbit based. Uh, they, uh, Amazon has its own uh, rocket launch company called Blue Origin. Uh, they are several years behind uh, compared to SpaceX. Okay. And um, their, their constellation will be about 3,000 uh, satellites, and uh, they will become operational once they have about 500 satellites in orbit. Altogether, it's still a big investment. It's about $10 billion to invest into this Project Hyper. And they also use the K and Q uh, frequency bands. Uh, uh, they are about 500, it's very similar. It's about 500 to 600 kilometers above Earth, uh, Leo orbit. Okay, now this is uh, the other, the third billionaire uh, called Richard Bronson, uh, who is the founder of Virgin Islands. So he has the project called OneWeb that is in Europe. Uh, so they have slightly smaller constellation and they'll be using the cool band. So this is for, for the customers in Europe. Now, China has uh, a couple of uh, firms, uh, China Aerospace Science and Technology and China Aerospace Science and the Industry. And they have two, two programs under development. The Wild Goose, Hongyan, okay, with about 324 satellites and the Rainbow Cloud System, the Hongyun, Hongyun, Hongyun system, okay. And uh, what the, their differentiation is that they will not only provide the internet, but they also will provide 5G technology with, the, with the, their satellite system. So this is sort of like a picture of the Hongyan constellation. Um, they will also start beginning operations in 2022. Most of the uh, schedule, they are all usually delayed by a year or so year to year and a half. So I wouldn't be surprised that this will move into 2023. The original plan for Starlink was 2021 and we're already to 2022. Okay. So they, they will launch, uh, China will launch about 60 of these satellites. And uh, usually it takes about a few hundred satellites for, for it to begin operations. Okay. So now let's talk about a little bit uh, different uh, type of uh, subtopic, which are what are some of the problems that uh, the satellites and the space technology faces. Uh, for example, space debris, uh, light pollution, uh, and the impact on astronomy. Okay, the other thing is that what are some of the risks that sending satellites to space? Uh, geomagnetic storms. So I will cover very quickly some of these issues. So usually, uh, as I mentioned, usually the life cycle, especially for LEO or satellites is about five to seven years. So what happens after five or seven years? You know, the, the, the satellite uh, becomes useless or, or maybe gets uh, malfunctions, okay? So what happens when they are still up there? Well, 
Right now, actually, the design allows these satellites is because they are in low Earth orbit, they can actually come down to Earth pretty easily, okay? And also, one of the other things that they're trying to uh, factor in is to make sure that satellites don't, don't uh, collide with each other because right now, there are so many different companies sending so many large number of satellites. It's, uh, it's almost like a traffic, uh, you know, car traffic here down, down on, on our planet, right? So the more vehicles, the more uh, chances of collision. So that is what we'll, we'll talk a little bit in one couple of slides, the Kessler syndrome, called the Kessler syndrome. Okay. So this is the Kessler syndrome. So this is a, an exaggeration, but if you have thousands and thousands of, of satellites, and just in case a few of them collide, they will be uh, releasing a lot of debris in outer space. And those debris in turn will be colliding with other satellites, okay? Causing, so it, it's sort of like a cascading effect, right? Because uh, the more collision it, it, it has uh, uh, happened, the more debris will be in outer, outer space. Just right now, before man-made satellites, they're the only things that are floating in outer space are like meteors or things like small, small, uh, you know, uh, pieces of, of rock. Uh, but with man-made stuff and there's such a large number of these satellites, it can cause a problem, okay? So this is one of the issues. Uh, it's called the Kessler syndrome, which is like if if a couple of slides collide, they can cause, they can release more debris and then debris, the debris can cause collision with further uh, uh, satellites in orbit. So this can be cascading and you'll be creating more and more debris. One other thing that uh, when the Starlink system was uh, released, People, some people observe that there are some lights on the sky. Actually, those were the satellites. So you can see that they are the satellites in our orbit. They, they follow a sequence, so they all space out. Okay, and each of these uh, lights are actually one satellite. Uh, and the reason was, was because the material that the satellites were made uh, actually created some light problems. So since then, right now, they, they, for newer satellites that are being released to space, now they are made, being made with some, uh, they are coated with some black substance that avoid this light reflection, okay? Because otherwise it looks like, the whole thing looks like, uh, uh, like a chain of lights, right? So that also impacts uh, astronomers who are trying to study uh, the space. So as the astronomers, they are really worried about the large number of satellites that are being released into space. Okay, because actually, uh, uh, as we show in the last slide, it, it, it uh, tampers with the visibility that try to observe through the telescopes, okay. So they are saying, well, uh, there better be some sort of like a control, okay? So with every new technology, there's also needs to have a mechanism to control uh, the new technology, okay? So that it doesn't have an adverse impact. Okay, one other thing that happened uh, this year in February, <clears throat> Some of you, I don't know where you guys read the technology news, but you know we mentioned that space releases, you know, like 60 satellites per shot, and there are a lot of satellites being already being shot into space. Well, uh, in the February shot, many of those satellites that were launched were actually uh, destroyed or or broken by this uh, geo geostorm. Okay. Uh, so geomagnetic storm. So that's basically caused by the sun. The sun is all is almost like uh, you know uh, fission, right? So there's a lot of uh, explosions on the on the surface of the sun, 
And those cause uh, a lot of a geomagnetic uh, impact that will affect the, the, the way that the satellites can function, okay? So that a lot of them that were launched in that batch got affected by this uh, geomagnetic storm. That this was back in uh, February. Okay, so the last talk, let me talk, I think we're exactly on time. So right now it's seven o'clock. I'll finish you definitely within 10 minutes. So the, the thing that we talk about communication is that in the past I've covered 5G technology and uh, right now the communication right now is actually uh, extending beyond uh, the surface, right? So be, besides the land-based land, land -based communications, we're now, we will just talk about this evening about satellite communication. So it's important that these two uh, methods of communication, they, are, they work in sync, okay? So they, they should be complementary to each other. So if you look at, again, in general about communication. So on, on the surface of the earth, you have all these, um, you know, towers and you have also mobile technology, you know, cell phones and, and so on. And then later on, you have a, a, above that, you have drones and you have, you know, helicopters. By the way, this is the same, uh, uh, the current situation in Ukraine right now is that people talk about, uh, uh, airspace control, and the Ukraine keeps asking about about the new uh, fighters. Well, right now, actually, uh, U.S. is helping Ukraine via a higher elevation uh, technology, which is the satellite base. There are a lot of uh, data, pictures, and so on being sent, captured by uh, U.S. satellites. So the same goes for uh, communications, where it's internet or, or GPS, is that so starting from the surface of the planet way back into outer space, you have different levels of uh, technology. And it's important that they uh, complement each other. As, a, as I mentioned, uh, space technology will be very useful in uh, deserts, desert areas or high peaks and high mountains uh, at sea where there's no, no cell towers at sea. Actually three fourths of the planet is, uh, is sea. So th there's a lot of area that currently is not being covered by uh, internet. So uh, basically the end goal is called ubiquitous connectivity, that means Internet everywhere, okay, ubiquitous, it means everywhere. So you have terrestrial networks and then we talk about space uh, or satellite uh, networks. And the two should really uh, talk to each other and uh, complement or supplement each other. So this is my last slide. To summarize, uh, I think in tonight's uh, uh, space and satellite technology presentation. I've basically talked about the, the what it is, why we need it, how it works, okay? Uh, advantages and benefits of it. And we also cover a little bit about space orbit technology, LEO, GEO. Um, we go over, went over some of the specifics about performance, the number of satellites, how the satellites are being launched using reusable rockets, who are the players, who are the companies who are getting into satellite internet. We also talk about a little bit about some of the issues and concerns in, in space. And we finally discuss a little bit about the complementary nature of uh, terrestrial and space communication technology. So uh, that's my talk. Uh, so I'll, I'll release the, the screen here. And turn it back to
to Yansu. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful topic. Um, I will begin by sharing my slides again, just uh, one or two slides. Okay, I would like to present this certificate to our speaker today, Dr. William Kao, in appreciation of your excellent speech entitled the Satellite Internet on April 19th, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Yansu. And um, while we take a like one minute break, I would like to um, show this slide again. Please check our website, cie-sf.org. Uh, also, please sign up our weekly e-newsletter and uh, follow one of our uh, medium channels using these uh, QR codes. And while displaying these QR codes, I will, I'm going through our chat. I do see there are some questions. I see that there are 18 chats. Let me see where I can see some of the questions. So I see one question. Let me try to answer some of the questions that I see. Yes, please. Um, what are the orbit parameters of Chinese satellites? Okay, I don't have all the details about the Hongyan and the Hong, Hongyun. But you probably can dig up, it's, everything is on the internet. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it suffice to say that they're probably not gonna be that much different than the, the they're gonna be Leo, Leo base, which is the altitude is probably gonna be about similar in the hundreds of kilometers above earth. And then the number of satellites I already mentioned in my talk. So they are, they are not as high number of satellites as the US, uh, you know, uh, Starlink system or, or uh, Project Kuiper from Amazon. But uh, they're going to be similar. So they're not going to be that much different. I also mentioned that the frequency band of transmission is also the Ka and the Ku. So uh, those are because those are the frequency that they allow for those satellite communications. So uh, even though the more specifics, you know, what's the exact altitude of the satellites or what's the speed that they travel. Those uh, I did not cover, you know, in, in, in the presentation, but if you are really interested, you probably can dig up on the, the specifics about the Hong, Hong Yan and Hong Yun. Okay. So that's the question that, let me see where I see any other questions. How Starlink are helping the war in Ukraine? Well, I already mentioned it in my talk is that uh, it's very interesting because I've been tracking the war pretty closely and um, there's no question that uh, even though Ukraine has the disadvantage in terms of the, the military equipment, the number of planes, the number of tanks and so on, oh, one thing that they, they, have, they do have an edge is because of the space technology and all the pictures that the, the US satellites are sending Ukraine. Okay, so, so that not only the, the satellite and space technology, but that is also complemented by, by the drone. Okay, so the airplanes, they fly a certain altitude. So we're talking about again, how high the planes fly. So above the plane, there's the, the satellites and below the plane, there's the drones, okay? So I think that Ukraine has the edge, slight edge in both higher altitude and lower altitude. And the medium is the, where the, the space, the, the airplanes. But the problem with this, the right now, because the, you don't see that much air superiority from the Soviet Union is because there's also the, the tampering you know, the, the way that the signals are being impacted because they are being perturbed by the, by the communication system. So the, the reason why they're like the same thing with happens with the Navy, 
they, they don't want to get too close to uh, the shores because they are afraid of the mis missiles, right? So the same thing. So that's the way that this, the technology, there's no question that this war actually is the heavily being affected or impacted by technology. Okay, so that's my question, my answer. Sharing ID. Uh, okay, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what it means, but so by the way, the, the tonight's program is being taped. So people who want access, they can get the, the a copy of the tonight's uh, presentation. I think I'll just somebody do a quick asked... stand. Yeah, yeah, uh, Yensu, go ahead. If you have a question uh, for me, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I, I see a question. Can we have a copy of your presentation? I know uh, Dr. William Carr has a policy of sharing presentation. Can you maybe see, uh, talk about that again? Sure, sure. Uh, so as I said, the whole presentation, of course, if you, if you look at the tape, you can, if you really want the whole thing, you can uh, take screenshots every slide, okay. So my general policy is that I have uh, like tonight's presentation is about 50 slides. And I have a, a practice that uh, has been in effect for the last 10 years is that uh, it, it does take me, you know, a lot of effort and time to put together the whole presentation. So uh, I'm, I'm willing to share any number of slides that you are interested, but I don't want to release the whole uh the whole presentation i don't want to give anybody the 50 slides but there's no secret in terms of if you want any of the any of the slides in specific you can send me a request or say could you please share with me five slides or 10 slides i'll be glad to send you any of the slides but i don't want to so the the entire package is, is sort of my own ip because a lot of the presentation and the slides were put together by my, myself a lot of the information all exists on the internet. So you can access and retrieve all the information on your own. But this presentation was put together by myself. So it's not like an existing presentation. So hopefully that answers it. Uh, you can release if uh, for people who are interested, my email, and they can send me an email and say, could you share you know, the, the, the table or whatever, some of the numbers. I'll be glad to send you any number of slides, but. Don't ask me for the 50 slides. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, thank you. I don't know, uh, Dr. William Paul, have you answered this question? What is the possibility of ubiquitous remote portable internet connectivity with higher powered LEO satellites that won't require the use of dishes or flat panel antennas? Uh, I guess if I understand the question correctly is that they are asking for where there's a capability that does not require uh, dishes and so on. I think that in the long run, that actually is a good goal because I was thinking like, let's say that, you know, this is a hypothetical case, but let's say you're climbing Mount Everest. Okay, so you're not really, you're not really at your home, but, but, but you want to tap into the satellite communications. Uh, it would be nice that you can access the satellite information even uh, though you are moving and you're an area that you, can, you don't have a dish. So, but that's probably further down the, the line. Right now, everything that I know of uh, with the current, current technology all requires a dish. And uh, so, so even at, at my own home, I have my is a direct TV and I have a, a, a satellite dish uh, installed on my roof. So right now, everything still requires a dish. But in the future, it'd be nice to be able to capture a signal without a dish. So like a mobile technology. Okay, any other questions? People who have uh, written uh, chat questions are welcome to ask uh, in person if, if I didn't answer their, uh, their specific question.
Okay, so it looks like uh, most of the the communication and data went pretty went through pretty well. Yes, uh, I don't see new questions, but I do have one question. Uh, as far as I remember, both Facebook and Google have attempt to uh, utilize uh, aerial vehicles to broadcast internet. So for example, Google had a project um, which I believe uh, was killed already, the project died, um, called Loon, which used hot balloons to uh, send internet devices to, to a high, high altitude, possibly higher than commercial plane uh, to avoid the weather um, and the yes, climate. I've heard. Yeah, I've heard yeah. about that project. Hot where balloons, they, and right? They use, they use balloons, use right? Drones. Yeah, Facebook used large drones that are larger than Boeing seven three seven, and they also fly uh, higher than commercial plane. Uh, so, so, so I think they are lower than the satellite devices you were talking about uh, uh, today. So, um, yeah, you're you can absolutely on, right. So yeah, let, let me let me uh, let me comment on that. Uh, sure, on that, please. Uh, yeah. So uh, two comments. One is that any uh, major technology company. So today I only mentioned you know uh, SpaceX, you know, and uh, Amazon. Uh, but any large companies, you know, whereas Apple, whereas Google, whereas Facebook, everybody is getting into space technology. So right now, space technology is the hot technology right now, okay, because they rely on this, uh, uh, but, uh, but it, it is very costly. So the reason why the first few entries are all billionaires, right? So you have, have Jeff Bezos from Amazon, you have uh, Elon Musk from uh, SpaceX, but everybody else is also interested in space technology. Now, uh, if you remember the, one of my last slides in terms of the different uh, altitudes. Remember, I talk about uh, uh, land base, and then you talk about drones. So you you mentioned uh, correctly is that there are a lot of companies who are trying to to do it at a slightly lower altitude than satellites. So they use balloons, <laughs> they use uh, drones. Okay, so uh, that is very true. So that is also other technologies, but they are not as sophisticated. And that is more regional. So if you think about it, the capability that those companies can handle is unless you go to outer space, you cannot cover as wide an area because balloons and so on, they're only in your vicinity because they are not high enough that they cannot cover in large enough area of the planet, okay? Uh, also, just even to talk about Leo, it requires more than a hundred satellites to cover the whole planet. So it depends on what your needs are. If your needs are only regional or, or local, then you can do it through uh, balloons, through drones and so on. But if you, if you want to cover like what this uh, uh, Amazon and space want to do is that they want to cover the whole planet. And that is the, what we talk about tonight is to cover the entire planet. So that, is not doable through drones and, and, and balloons. So it really depends on the, on the scope and the, uh, the space that you want to cover. So that's the answer. Thank you very much. Um, also, I don't see more questions. Okay. Uh, can you please uh, say your email again? I'm typing in the chat. Okay, uh, my email is uh, B as in Bill, B-K-A-O-2-K at yahoo.com. Maybe someone from the staff can uh, write it in chat. Uh, yes. B-K-O-2-K, yes. oh yeah, I see it. Mm -hmm. Speaker's email, okay. that's correct. B-K-O-2-K at yahoo.com. Yeah. So if anybody has any further questions or detailed questions that would like to uh, you know, correspond to me, please send me an email. Okay, and also if you want a certain slides, I'll be glad to send it to you. Save you the problem of uh, taking pictures of my uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you yeah. everyone for attending. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Let's end bye -bye. here. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone in our next um, event. Please check our upcoming seminars and talks on our website and also uh, feel free uh, to join our annual conference on May 14th, which is an in-person event. Thank you. Thanks everyone and good night.